Hey, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, EE 231. Um, the, um, let's see, I see you have um, already received a reader from, um, from Kevin, and um, everyone got two volumes, is that right? One volume will be the slides that I will, will use for the lecture, and uh, the second volume is um, a collection of, um, of um, uh, articles for you to read. Um, I noticed that uh, there's a, a sign-up sheet being passed around. Um, what is that for? That's an excellent uh, uh, idea. There's a second uh, uh, use we're going to make of that uh, sheet. In a way, it's a, a receipt of, um, of, um, of the uh, readers that you received today. Um, we have limited uh, number of uh, copies of these um, um, booklets that we handed out today. And we do understand that some of you may decide not to enroll in the class later on. When that happens, we would um, like to ask you to return these readers uh, to me or to Kevin so that we can uh, give them to the other students who will show up next week. It always happens, you know, uh, the first two weeks is a flux of students in the class. So make sure you return these readers if you decide not to enroll in this class. Is it OK? All right, thank you. OK, I'd like to uh, direct your attention to the, uh, um, the course uh, syllabus that I uh, just put up on the screen. And why don't we go through that uh, together. And uh, uh, you can ask me questions anytime. Uh, as we go through this uh, syllabus, all right? All right, my name is uh, Chen Ming Hu, and uh, the course is Solid State Devices E231. Uh, it has four units. I guess I'll mention that because um, many graduate course uh, have three units. Uh, this has four units, and sometimes students miss that, and that's because we have an extra discussion uh, session that I will uh, take care of. Uh, every uh, Tuesday um, after the Tuesday lecture, all right? Now, I'm very glad that Kevin is uh, serving as the uh, uh, TA for us this semester, and I think I've all met Kevin. Kevin, wave your hand. And Kevin uh, is uh, very knowledgeable um, and uh, also um, has a, a good uh, um, skill in answering questions, and so I'm very happy that he's uh, working um, with me for this course. Uh, he uh, has an office hour. That's Monday, 1 to 2 p.m. Where are you going to hold this office hour? Uh, oh, you did. All right. So you, you'll see 288, uh, Corey. And uh, I guess I have not given you my office hour. Um, since uh, Kevin is holding his office hour on Monday, I think I will hold it on um, on a Thursday, All right? Uh, I'll hold it on a Thursday. Uh, I'll make it uh, 2 to 3 p.m., okay? And I'll hold it in my office. That's 508 Quarry Hall. Okay, good. As I said, we will hold a discussion session on Tuesday, 5 to 6, in this room. So right after the lecture, we're going to take a 10-minute break and uh, come back for the, uh, for the discussion. Uh, during this hour, I hope you're going to bring a lot of questions here and have a lively discussion. I think that's the best uh, um, material to, uh, uh, to use for discussion is questions from you. Uh, we could spend some time talking about homework problems. Um, if you don't have questions, maybe I'll bring some additional materials, maybe some sample problems, some supplementary materials. And this discussion session is a, is a attendance of this discussion session is a mandatory. It's not optional. So treat this uh, as seriously as you treat the lecture. So come to the discussion session. We're not going to hold the discussion session today. So it's going to start in the second week, okay? A week from today, all right? Okay. We uh, are going to use a uh, 
a textbook. It's called a Silicon Processing for the VSI Era, Volume 3. Uh, the subtitle for this volume is Submicron MOSFET. Stanley Wolf, and um, this book should be available in the ASUC bookstore, and perhaps in some no. Okay. Uh, do you do do you happen to know if it's on order or what? They said they have them in their warehouse. They're going to shelf them today or tomorrow. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that information. Um, uh, they should have enough copies for the class. And um, uh, if you wish to uh, look for the book um, um, in other bookstores uh, on uh, uh, Durant, um, you may find it somewhere mm. or so. Really? That's what I mean. Hmm. So they told me, I don't know if that's new or used or, hmm. or anything. All right. I certainly requested more. Uh, well, this gives you some incentive to, um, to buy more. As you know, if there's not enough copies, they can order. And uh, probably will be a two-week delay. So try to get your copy early. All right. Um, I, I put a... Uh, a book uh, on reserve in the engineering library as a reference book. I uh, like the book um, quite a bit. It's um, this book is kind of uh, um, written for a level between a graduate course and undergraduate course. A little, uh, um, I think. Uh, uh, well, I, I don't know how to. I don't want to <laughs> pigeonhole this book, but it's a very well written book. I certainly recommend you to. Go to this reference if you uh, need some additional uh, reading material. Um, you should not have to go to this uh, reference, at least not often, but if you find it on a particular topic, you would like to read some more, I recommend this uh, uh, book uh, as a reference. Now, we're going to have uh, some homework assignment, exams, and grades. Let me go through my plan for them. There will be about six homework assignments, maybe seven. In other words, every other week there should be a homework uh, um, assignment. And uh, I encourage you to discuss the homework and uh, collaborate on the homework, but don't copy homeworks, other people's homework, all right? Um, what I mean by that is that you're encouraged to work on the homework with your friends but you must write your own answer. So that's my definition of what is a copying and what is collaboration, you see? Uh, you have to, you can talk as much as you want. In fact, I encourage you to do that. I think uh, that's a very uh, important part of learning is really to discuss the material you studied with your friends and challenge each other. And, but after that discussion, I'd like you to work separately to write down what you, you have um, um, Concluded from your discussion with the with the friends, and uh, write your own solutions. Okay. And you have don't hesitate to ask the uh, the TA or me for clarification of the homework problems. Um, sometimes we, ho we we would try to avoid this, but there may even be a typographical error in the homework statement, and it will be. Um, Certainly, a shame that if you um, you know uh, spend hours uh, struggling over something which which uh, is uh, um, which uh, which is a mistake to begin with, and we could have cleared that up for you very quickly. So don't hesitate to ask for um, <coughs> clarifications and suggestions. We'd we'll be happy to give you hints here, problems. And uh, I try to make the problems quite um, interesting and challenging. I hope you're going to like those homeworks. Um, so pay attention to the homework. We uh, encourage cooperation rather than competition in, in all aspects of the learning, uh, preparing for exams, um, just discussion of uh, the uh, lectures in general. Um, I hope you will really uh, take advantage of the fact that uh, there are a lot of uh, other smart uh, students in the class, so get to know the people sitting close to you uh, before you, you leave today. The uh, great weighting is, uh, uh, will be done as follows. Homework, 10%, not very heavy weight. This does not reflect uh, my sense of uh, how important the homework is, but rather reflect my um, uh, the fact that not only I'm asking you to collaborate, in fact, a lot of the homework problems are um, reused 
from um, previous years. As I said, I uh, like these this, uh, this homework problems. I think they are, they are interesting. Um, so if you want to look for the old homework solutions, I'm sure you'll find them uh, from your friends who have taken this course uh, last, last year. So for that reason, I couldn't give uh, too, too heavy a weight on homework, but I cannot stress the uh, importance of doing the homework. It's very important. Certainly your effort on the homework is going to pay off in the uh, examinations. There will be two midterm examinations, and uh, they will be um, held uh, um, probably a little bit um, um, a week or so later than the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, midterm one, midterm two exam in other courses. This is because we're not going to have the final exam, right? So instead of the final exam, we're, you're going to do a term paper for this course. So the term paper takes place for the uh, final examination. So that takes care of the mechanics of the course. Any questions? All right, the content of the uh, course. So the next two pages, I'm giving you uh, chapter by chapter and section by section of what we're going to do and uh, not cover by the, um, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the book, okay? So we're gonna start with chapter three, MOS uh, capacitor. And we're gonna talk about um, uh, a more quantitative model of about the uh, MOS capacitor than um, the piecewise uh, continuous model that uh, you have studied uh, in undergraduate courses. Uh, we're going to um, then move on to chapter six. Well, chapter six actually is assigned reading. What this means is this assigned reading uh, means is that um, I would not uh, lecture on this topic. Um, this course, I will make that very much uh, focused uh, on device, device physics, device modeling, device concepts. Uh, when it comes to a technology such as isolation, uh, I think it's uh, good that the, the textbook has a chapter of that and uh, it's useful for you to know about it. So I'm assigning this as a um, assigned reading. But I will not cover, by, uh, cover it in the lecture. It probably will not be represented uh, much in the homework, if at all, and um, in the uh, examinations, perhaps will be very small um, weight will be given to these chapters. So, so, so basically, this is for your own benefit. There are two chapters, maybe three treated this way. So isolation technology is one such a uh, chapter. Uh, then we talk about chapter four. It's not exactly the title of the textbook. Maybe it is, I'm, I don't remember. But uh, uh, certainly it is talking about uh, sort of the more fundamental theory of uh, uh, MOSFETs. Um, although when we say fundamental, you're gonna find it's uh, again treated somewhat different from the uh, undergraduate treatment of, uh, of MOSFET theory. So we're going to, to, to uh, re well, for that reason, I don't want to call this review, although some of this will be review of the MOS uh, transistor. Um, then I'm going to ask you to read chapter one and two, and uh, the topic of those two chapters is uh, device simulators, device simulation as a sign reading. So what is the uh, device simulators about? What, uh, what's inside the device simulators? What equations do they solve? Um, so I'm gonna ask you to read that. And then we'll move on to advanced MOSFET. In some sense, chapter five is uh, the, 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 the core of this course. This course is um, about advanced MOSFET, so this is going to be a very important chapter, all right? We're gonna be talking about the short channel effect, we're talking about more accurate models of the uh, transistor IV, and uh, so quite a few topics we're gonna talk about in chapter five. And then chapter eight is assigned reading CMOS well technology. Remember you had the two assigned readings um, um, before, that is uh, the um, isolation technology, low cost or shallow trench isolation, and then uh, chapter one, two, device simulation. Now here is the third assigned reading, that will be CMOS well technology. And then we're going to uh, resume a lecture with the chapter nine called, uh, the title is Hot Carry Effects in LDD. That's uh, the topic. 
and then we're going to uh, lecture on chapter seven, gate oxide. That will be the last uh, chapter that uh, we lecture on, and that concludes the uh, content of this course. Any questions what we will be covering in this course? All right, depending on the uh, progress, typically I save uh, one or two lectures at the end and uh, talk uh, a, a little bit about uh, current topic in uh, bipolar technology. Bipolar is not uh, a, uh, a um, uh, let me say, a topic that will be covered comprehensively in this course. This course is about advanced uh, MOS transistors but um, we probably will have one or two lectures on uh, bipolar at the end, okay? All right. If there are no questions about the content or mechanics, um, we'll um, just get on to uh, the first lecture. Uh, any questions? Yes. Lower novel, all right. Very good. Uh, um, first, uh, I want to say something before I forget. I um, was requested by the um, audiovisual department to uh, make a request of you. When you ask questions or make a comment, would you please uh, use the microphone that's uh, uh, attached under the, the, the table and uh, speak uh, into the microphone? This is for the benefit of the uh, the uh, uh, video tape. Um, you can review the tape. If you miss a lecture, sometimes you can review the tape. The tape is also made available by the uh, college to uh, companies that to subscribe to uh, some courses. So speaking to the, um, the microphone, all right? Jim was asking, um, uh, uh, can I uh, uh, plan some lectures for the uh, novel devices? And that's a very good point. In fact, it's just remind me, what I just reviewed with you, those uh, a few pages of which chapter to read, which chapter to cover, actually was not a complete list of the topic that I will cover by lecture. What uh, those three pages cover are how we're going to handle um, each chapter from the textbook. In addition to the textbook, I will um, give you uh, signed readings uh, in the second volume of um, of um, the hand uh, of the uh, reader that you received today, and there, and I will cover also by lectures uh, many topics that's not in the textbook. For example, SOI um, devices and technology, and uh, novel devices, uh, double gate device, for example, or what's what's um, maybe in the future beyond CMOS. Um, and um, a few uh, topics, uh, additional topics like that. All right, so yes, uh, I do plan to um, um, discuss uh, novel devices, uh, devices beyond the planar CMOS. Okay, other questions? All right, now, it, so I probably should um, um, include those uh, additional topics in this uh, in this course um, uh, syllabus it's because it's not there. If you are curious what topics will be covered, um, the um, probably the best thing to do is not don't do it now <laughs> at your your leisure. Just flip through the uh, uh, the, the uh, slides that I plan to use for the course, and you will find um, um, I think. Um, get a pretty good idea what the materials I plan to, uh, to cover, all right? Okay, let's move on. Uh, let's just go to uh, page eight. I'm skipping two pages. On the bottom lower right corner of each page, there's a page number um, 1.8. Okay, there's no need to zoom uh, out right now. We can go back to the, to the, uh, the table itself. Uh, I just want to use this table to point out a few things. First, this table came from uh, uh, a, a document called International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors. Now, people who do research or advanced development in industry or do research in the um, uh, in universities uh, pay a lot of attention to this document. This document is the collective uh, 
uh, wisdom of uh, the uh, semiconductor um, industry, or maybe I should say people who do research and advanced development in industry, uh, in the industry as well as in universities, and um, uh, some of us get together um, to talk about uh, what are the um, likely, uh, um, what, 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 what technologies uh, future um, are likely, and um, update this document uh, once um, every two years or so. And the latest version is the 1999 version, and and the document itself has about uh, oh 400 pages, very large document. Here I'm just taking, a, uh, it's just an excerpt served from one of the many tables from this document. And I just want to point out, if you have not um, um, noticed this before, that uh, the. Um, um, Semiconductor technologies often uh, refreshed or renewed, and we say new generations of technologies are introduced. And specifically, every three years, a new generation of technology is introduced. This has been the historical trends. Sometimes in the last uh, a few years, the uh, uh, introduction rate uh, exceeded the historical trend. In fact, a generation of technology was introduced every two years. But the projection is that in the future we'll continue to follow this three-year every generation uh, rate. So you notice 99, 2002, 2005, 2008, 2011. This is uh, the year of uh, introduction of a new technology and there's three years in between. Notice that, right? Second thing, second line is the gate length. Sometimes we call it LG the gate length. And uh, other times we can call this the minimum feature size. Um, the the um, it, technology, you know, is, is, um, is technology, is engineering. We, 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 we don't want to be tied by uh, rules too tightly. So when we use words uh, like like minimum feature size, um, it, we always have to take that with a with, with um, a l with a little grain of salt. Just what what does that mean? Sometimes you will find that there are features that are actually um, smaller than what we call the uh, minimum uh, feature size. For that reason, it's a little. But with that caveat, let me just say I'll call this the minimum feature size. All right, this line is essentially the minimum feature size. Okay. Minimum feature size. Minimum feature size. This line. All right. So if you, before we go on, then let's all right. Let's start. Stay with this. Now, for example, right now we're, we 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 say we're in the 180 nanometer generation of technology. 180 nanometer is equal to 0 0.18 micron. So sometimes we say we are at 0.18 micron generation. This means this minimum feature size is about 0.18 micron. Right? Three years from now, we expect to be in 130 nanometer. And more and more, we're moving from 0.13 micron as the unit to 130 nanometer, using na nanometer as the unit, just because um, you know it's uh, not convenient to carry the point in front when we are in the one micron generation, two micron generation, certainly using microns very nice. But now we often say we're at 130 nanometer, or we will be at 130 uh, nanometer generation. And then the next generation will be the 100 nanometer, 70 nanometer, 50 nanometer. Now you notice, roughly speaking, each generation has a minimum feature size that's 0 0.7 times of the feature size of the previous generation. So there's a size reduction of 0 0.7. Every two generations will be 0 0.7 times 0 0.7, which are about 0 0.5, all right? And this is what you see. 180 if divided by 2 will be 90, but we usually round up to 1,000. Uh, 100, 100 divided by 2 will be 50, all right? So if we add another column, this will be 25 nanometer, okay? So that has been the historical trend. And because this historical trend, 
every company expects the competitor to do this, and therefore it will decide to do it. And uh, it's kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. So we kind of expect this uh, to go on. And there's really no better way to, to justify why it should be every three years and why every generation's reduction by 0.3. Then uh, that's pretty much what, what uh, um, um, everyone expect the competition to do, so everyone will try very hard to meet that goal. Meeting that goal is really very hard. If you can exceed it, of course, you will do it, but it's very difficult to exceed, exceed this, right? Now, as I said, minimum feature size is, um, um, is, is misleading because even today, uh, CPUs has, are made with uh, transistors with gate lengths less than the minimum feature lengths. So companies will try very hard to make the transistor gate lengths a little bit smaller than sup what's supposed to be min minimum feature size. Okay? If you try hard enough, you can always get something that's, um, that's uh, even smaller in feature size than the, than the uh, rest of the uh, features, let's, such as metal width. So for the poly gate width, they're a little smaller for the CPUs, for the high speed, the digital products. And that's the projection of the gate lengths. Right? For DRAM gate lengths, usually follows the minimum feature uh, size, sometimes even a little larger. A very significant trend is that the power supply voltage has been reducing from one generation to another. And uh, this is uh, uh, necessitated by the fact that uh, power dissipation um, is getting to be very large. So with these hundreds of millions of transistors on a chip, if we don't use very low power supply voltage, there simply are too many watts of heat dissipated on the chip. So that's driving this power dissipation, uh, a, a power voltage reduction, and of course battery uh, lifetime is another consideration. And uh, in order to maintain the performance of the transistor, which really means in order to maintain the current drive capability of the transistor in the face of uh, reduced power supply voltage, the industry has to try very hard to reduce the oxide thickness, the gate oxide thickness. And we're already using less than uh, 20 angstrom or 20 angstrom for production right now. Um, it's very challenging, as you can imagine, to make the oxide uh, much thinner than that, but that is what has to be done. The shaded area is what is roadmap called no known solutions. In other words, industry is not quite sure how we can meet this projected trend. Well, for example, don't know how to design a transistor with good performance and uh, design a circuit with a good uh, speed at this low voltage. But it seems that we have to get there if we want to keep the uh, power dissipation under control and still meet the project needs to increase the, uh, the uh, density of the chip, put more transistors on the chip. So these are projected trends, and yet a lot of these projected uh, um, uh, technology has no known solutions today. All right. Other important things to remember is something called ION, sometimes we'll just simply call it IDSAT, which basically is saturation current. And we want to th this current to be as large as, as possible, and we want to keep the off-state current as small as possible. Okay? And uh, the uh, um, roadmap uh, calls out ION and all IOF uh, trend or goals separately for high performance circuit and for low power circuit. So for low power circuit, we're willing to take a smaller amount, smaller current, and circuit will be slower, but we um, um, ask for much lower leakage current so that the standby power is a lot smaller. You notice the, the unit for the low power uh, I off is picoamp per micron. Micron is the width of the transistor, W of the transistor. Whereas the unit for the leakage current, off-state current for the high-performance devices is given in nanoampere per micron. So we're asking for 1,000 times less leakage in, the, in some handheld uh, um, 
products compared to what Intel would be willing to accept, right, for their desktop computer, for example. All right, any questions about uh, the um, um, background of technology that we'll be uh, dealing with? Question. Yes. Uh, what is the meaning of the 360 and the 230? All right. The slash here is the MOS FAT, MOS and PMOS. In a um, CMOS technology, as you know, there are two type of transistors, N channel and P channel. So 750 microamp per micron of width is the goal for the ID set of N channel transistor, and for P channel transistor, is about a factor of two smaller. All right? The leakage current goal is the same for P channel and N channel transistor. Other questions? Okay, thanks for that question. All right, now we're going to move on. And uh, I uh, mentioned earlier that we'll start with chapter three. The topic is a MOSFET capacitor. Um, there is uh, some uh, introduction, and you can read on your own, read 3.1. 3.2 is review of a MOSFET capacitor before we go on to a more quantitative, more advanced model. Let's review what uh, um, you should have already uh, studied before as a prerequisite for this course. As you know, the prerequisite for this course is, is EE130, and uh, if you uh, um, studied that course here, then you definitely have the correct prerequisite. If you took an undergraduate level uh, semiconductor device uh, course with perhaps uh, oh, more than uh, three, four weeks on MOS um, um, transistor or capacitor, um, you can you can consider that you have satisfied a prerequisite uh, for this course, and uh, you should be able to follow everything uh, we do in, in, in this course. Now, if you have not had uh, um, many weeks of uh, uh, study of um, MOS uh, devices at undergraduate level in undergraduate course, then uh, I recommend you take uh, E130 before taking uh, this course. Okay, especially if you're taking it for credit, that uh, where where the uh, grades is going to reflect on your GPA. I think um, it would not be good for you to take this course without prerequisite. Okay, all right. So what we'll be doing here in this this hour is essentially do a review at the level of um, a um, um, undergraduate MOS model. I want to make sure that we all start at the same uh, level. So let's look at that. I hope you find this uh, uh, diagram familiar. This is called energy band diagram drawn for the flat band condition. In this energy band diagram, what is a uh, uh, Flat is there's a level called a vacuum level is totally flat, and you notice the band in the gate, in the oxide, and in the silicon substrate are all flat, and we are assuming that we have a polysilicon gate. And therefore, for this uh, gate, we also let's see. I guess we did not indicate this is the gate. Let me write. This is the gate, and this is the um, oxide. And here is what we would call the body or the substrate. Let's look at the gate first. We assume the gate is made of a polycrystalline silicon. That's why we, re we represent its a band uh, uh, <coughs> diagram with a conduction band called E sub C, a valence band edge, E sub V, and also a Fermi level, E sub F. <coughs> Fermi level is drawn very close to the conduction band edge, indicating this is doped to what type? It's M plus poly or P plus poly? Right, we're, we're, we're assuming this M plus poly. That's why the Fermi level is drawn very close to conduction band edge. The uh, uh, SiO2 also has a conduction band edge and a valence band edge, but we're not going to make a lot of use of the uh, valence band edge of that uh, uh, SiO2, so we omit second half, lower half of the uh, band diagram of the SiO2, and only shows the conduction band edge for the SiO2. And uh, 
on the uh, right hand side substrate we know there's the silicon substrate EC is lower than the well maybe I'll up this way the separation between the conduction band and the vacuum level has a name and I would not review that with you um, it's called the electron affinity for for SiO2 the separation between the vacuum level and the conduction band is 0 0.95 eV for uh, uh, silicon is uh, 4.05 eV this is the electron affinity for silicon as a result the, the conduction band edge of SiO2 and silicon is offset by about 3.1 eV this is often called the barrier height at the silicon silicon dioxide interface the conduction bands are offset by this <coughs> 3.1 eV it's the barrier height for the electrons for the holes there's a separate barrier height another quantity that's useful to know is the separation between the vacuum level and the Fermi level what do we call that separation the difference between vacuum level and Fermi level of a material is the blank of this material what is that the work function that's right phi s s stands for the substrate or semiconductor work function all right so this is the work function does the gate and substrate have the same work function no they don't even though both the substrate and the gate are silicon they have different work functions because they have different Fermi levels you see one is the M plus material one the substrate will assume to be P type therefore they have different Fermi level and therefore different work functions the gate work function is called a phi M this is standard notation in most textbooks M stands for metal because the gate is used to be metal uh, today of course it's not metal but we still call it, use this uh, subscript M to represent the uh, the um, gate work function and uh, phi s is the uh, substrate or psi s is the uh, substrate uh, or or silicon well let's call the substrate the work function all right this represents a situation this energy banner represents situation at a finite gate voltage in other words the gate and the substrate are not at the same voltage you can tell that by the fact the two Fermi levels the Fermi level of the gate and the Fermi level of the substrates are not lined up in fact the separation of the Fermi levels at the two terminals of a device is the voltage difference across these two terminals of the device so we should be able to tell that the voltage that's applied to the gate in reference to the substrate is indicated graphically by this arrow because this arrow indicates difference of the two Fermi levels <coughs> and this particular voltage the voltage that we have to apply on the gate in order to make the bands flat in order to create a flat band condition is called a flat band voltage now graphically you can see this flat band voltage is the difference between the two Fermi levels phi m and the phi s all right now in this particular example phi m is smaller than phi s and therefore we expect flat band voltage to be negative now is it negative can you tell just based on this this graph that the gate is at a more negative voltage than the substrate can you tell yes you can because in the band diagram any energy level that's high if you move up in this energy band diagram that means more negative voltage it is more as larger energy for electrons going up vertically in this diagram is larger electron energy and therefore must be lower electrical voltage right you know the electrical voltage is uh, low when the electron energy is large okay this is because the voltage is defined <coughs> Um, as the potential for a positive charge but for semiconductor physics historically people have uh, chosen to draw this energy band diagram for increasing electron energy not for put, uh, the, 
potential energy of a positive charge. Therefore, the voltage and electron energy is reversed. Because the Fermi level of the gate is a higher point than the Fermi level of the substrate, we know flat band voltage is negative. And indeed, phi m is smaller than phi s. So in this particular example, VFB is negative. You see that? All right. Now, because we use the difference between phi m and phi, uh, phi s often in this chapter, uh, we actually give it a, a, a new notation called phi m s. Phi m s is just defined as the difference between phi m and phi s. In fact, it's defined as phi m minus phi s, all right? Such that uh, in this ideal case, phi m s is the flat band voltage. The flat band, flat band voltage is phi m s. And you should be able to tell in this example, VFB is negative. All right, any questions? If you have questions, just raise your hand and speak into the microphone, all right? Yes? When you determine the work function, you need always a positive thing? Work function is always defined as a positive value. That's correct. So the bathroom level is the reference, and below that is the additive constant. Uh, if you call them out as a, as a voltage, that's true. But that's not the reason why uh, work function is always positive. If, even if you represent the work function as energy, as EV, and by the way, in semiconductor electronics, at least not for uh, in semiconductor physics, the work function sometimes given in the units of EV, sometimes given in the units of voltage. For example, in this case, calling the work function given the work function a unit of voltage, just make the equation simpler. Because we know the flat band voltage should have units of voltage. So we say the work function is uh, 4.5 volt. In this case, we implicitly did that. Whereas uh, if you really look at handbook of physics and uh, chemistry, you know work function should have a units of, uh, of uh, energy, EV. So in that sense, the work function is not treated as a voltage. So we should not count as positive going down. The fact that work function is positive is not because we use the uh, vacuum level as reference and uh, or, or not because the way we count the, the voltage positive as we move down. Just because the physicist has decided the work function is negative, is positive. All right? That's, that's all. Okay? All right, other questions? Good question. Thanks. Now, next, we're going to move away, deviate from this uh, flat band condition. The flat band condition is a great starting point. Anytime you have questions about the energy band diagram of MOS system, I recommend you start from the flat band condition, all right? But that's the starting point. Uh, in general, of course, the gate voltage is not equal to VFB. So let's look at the, um, uh, what happens when VG is not equal to VFB. Now. If VG is not e equal to VFB, there's a very important relationship. At flat band, VG is equal to VFB. That's flat band. If VG is not equal to VFB, the difference between VG and, and VFB has to be picked up by voltage drop either in the substrate or in the oxide. We're assuming the gate is so heavily doped, it's almost like metal. There cannot be any voltage drop in the gate right now, all right? We can modify that later on. But right now, we're assuming there's no voltage drop in the gate. If that's the case, then any difference between VG and VFB has to be taken up by voltage drop in the substrate and voltage drop in the oxide. Is that right? Voltage drop in the oxide is more straightforward. Graphically, it's just this quantity. That's the voltage drop in the oxide. And we call that Vox, OX <coughs> as subscript. All right? That's the oxide voltage, voltage across the oxide. Voltage drop in the substrate is more interesting and more complicated. We call that phi s. Phi s can be called the surface potential. So you can consider the s as, ref, uh, as, as uh, representing surface. That's quite all right. It can also be interpreted as voltage in the substrate, voltage drop in the substrate. In that case, you can uh, think of uh, this uh, subscript s representing substrate, and that's fine too. It's also the band bending in the substrate. Now, as you remember, band bending represent a voltage change. Anytime when the energy band diagram bends, changes shape or position, that means there's changing voltage. 
since we use the substrate, the neutral region of substrate uh, as reference, then at point at the surface, the potential, the voltage cannot be the same as the voltage or the potential at the neutral portion of substrate. This is our ground. We use this as reference. If this is reference, then at the surface there is a finite voltage, finite potential, and that voltage specifically is the band bending. Right? So the, the voltage drop in the substrate is the band bending. Is that right? That's the definition. That's the meaning of any bending of bands. Any bending of the energy band represents a change in voltage. Is that right? Therefore, the voltage, the potential uh, drop in the substrate is the band bending. It also can be called a surface potential. Why? Because if we consider this as zero potential, then the potential of the surface is this quantity phi s. All right? So that's the meaning of phi s. So there are three names for phi s. It's the voltage drop in the substrate, it's the surface potential, and it's the band bending. They all represent the same thing. Okay? All right. Why do I draw this arrow downward? What, what, what am I trying to, to do? Well, it's a rather, uh, it's an attempt um, to remind you again that voltage, it's a positive voltage when the band bends downward. First potential is positive when the band bends downward toward the surface. Remember, any time the bands bend down, every time we go down in the NH band diagram, the potential, the, the voltage increases, right? The electric potential increases. The electron energy decreases, but the electrical potential and the voltage increase. So this indicates this is the direction of increasing phi s, all right? And this indicates our Vg. You see the difference between EF and uh, the EF of the uh, of the gate is our Vg, all right? So can you see graphically that this Vg? Ah, here this is uh, uh, it's not so obvious. So I would not go with with that because you don't see where VFB is. So graphically, you will not see that the, these two S together. But do you see that based on this equation, this equation makes a lot of sense, right? First, you just remember Vg equal to Vfb when there's no voltage drop in the substrate and when there's no voltage drop in the oxide. When there are finite voltage drop in the oxide and the substrate, then Vg is equal to Vfb plus Vox plus phi S. Make sense? Okay, it's a very important relationship. Okay, we're gonna use that many times. A few other important relationships. What determines this Vox? What determines the charge in oxide? Well, charge and voltage across oxide. Voltage across oxide is equal to minus QS over Cox. I'll leave the proof to the reader. You can prove this if you need a proof. Some of you think, may think this is a trivial, intuitively right, and that's good enough for me. As long as you, 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 you find this intuitively correct, then you, you have good intuition, just stay with it. If you find this uh, a little strange, you want to prove it, I'll give you a hint. Use Gauss law to find the electric field in the uh, oxide, and you will find Gauss law is proportional to QS. Is that right? Does that make sense? And if you know the electric field in the oxide, multiply by the oxide thickness, you will get voltage drop in the oxide, right? Okay, so you can prove this yourself. So this is correct. So right now, we're not proved to you, but I would just want to discuss with you make so that you see this is this does make sense intuitively right what this we're saying is that you can think of the mos capacitor truly as a capacitor really as far as the voltage drop in the oxide is concerned v is indeed equal to q over c just what you would expect all right what makes this capacitor a little unusual is that there's a voltage drop in the substrate in one of the electrodes that makes this a little unusual other than that, it's really just a capacitor. V is equal to C, Q over C. Okay? All right? So just remember that. It's true. And if you need to, 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 pro to derive it, as I said, you can derive it. Use Gauss law, all right? But once you derive it, just remember V ox is equal to QS over C ox. This QS represents all the charge in the substrate, not just the charge in the depletion layer. Not just charge in the inversion layer, not just charge in the accumulation layer, all the charge in the substrate, all right? If you have interface trap charge or any other charge in the, in the substrate, we'll all lump them into this quantity called the QS, right? Again, 
just remember this is what the charge in your Gauss box. So you can see why this QS represent all the charging substrate. This minus sign uh, uh, may need a little bit of discussion. We usually think of V in capacitor as Q over C, right? When we think of a capacitor, we say it's Q over C. In this particular case, we usually implicitly think of one side as a reference, and when we take it V, let's say we take V on one electrode, let's say in this case the top electrode. What about Q? Where do we take the Q in this, uh, in, 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 in when we think about capacitor? Which electrode do we take Q from? Take from the top electrode or the bottom electrode? You know, as electrical engineer in circuits, in electrical circuit, we take the Q and V from the same electrode. That's why we have a positive sign, right? But in the semiconductor uh, device physics, the charge in the gate, we do take the voltage from the gate. That's convention. We like to take the substrate as reference, all right? That's the convention. So we take the voltage from the gate, from the top electrode. But we don't take the charge from the gate. It's not interesting. We like to talk about the charge in the substrate, all the interesting things happening in the substrate, like how much charge is in the inversion layer. So the QS is the charge in the bottom electrode. Did you notice that? We're taking the charge and voltage from opposite the electrode, therefore there's a minus sign, okay? So those are a few things that can throw you off, but just, re just remember, after you have seen this once today, I hope you remember this, V is equal to minus QS over C, ox. All right? Okay. All right, so next we look into a case when uh, VG is less than VFB. Uh, again, starting with the flat band condition in your, in your mind, fl when everything's flat. Then we make the VG more negative than that flat band condition. Ne more negative meaning we push the gate side of the energy band diagram down or up. Negative voltage meaning moving upward in the band diagram, is that right? So we push the gate up. If you push the gate up, does it make sense? The energy band diagram will look somewhat like that, right? Makes sense, right? So this is what we get when we apply a voltage that's more negative than the flat band voltage. When this happens, we notice that there has to be some voltage drop across the oxide. There has to be some voltage drop in the substrate. In the substrate, as the bands start to bend, we notice the Fermi level of um, getting close to the valence band edge, or the valence band edge is moving closer to the Fermi level. When that happens, we all know that the whole density becomes large. So here's another equation I want you to memorize. When I put equation in a uh, box, that means uh, students of this course either should have memorized this uh, uh, equation before or should memorize this uh, uh, now, all right? So remember these equations. These are simple equations. This is certainly another thing to remember. The whole density is equal to mv. mv is a constant for a given material. It's about 10 to the 19th per cubic centimeter. Actually, for all semiconductors, about 10 to the 19th per cubic centimeter. If you look up any textbook, you'll find a, a more exact number, perhaps 2.3 times 10 to the 19th or something like that. I just made that, that number up, okay? So don't take that seriously. But it's about 10 to the 19th per, per cubic centimeter. We should remember that. So P is equal to constant exponential minus EF min uh, minus EV over KT. So any time when EV gets close to EF, we have a large hole density. Any time when EV moves away from EF, we have small hole density. So as a result of this VG, band is bending up, and we end up with large density of holes near the surface. We say the surface is in accumulation, or there's accumulation layer in the surface. Accumulation layer just refer, refers to this uh, layer of uh, holes. Okay? All right. And uh, notation-wise, we use uh, uh, subscript S to represent at the surface. So PS is the whole density at the surface. So subscript S is for surface. And as you know, this uh, zero is a uh, uh, subscript for equilibrium. So P naught is the equilibrium whole concentration, right? And P naught often would be, say, equal to the doping concentration, right? 
equal to the substrate doping concentration. So under this condition, the surface hole concentration is much larger than the uh, doping concentration. All right. Now, one interesting thing is that in this particular case, phi s, the band bending cannot be very large. In fact, we usually make the phi s quite small. Uh, we usually assume or expect the phi s to be very small. Why? Because by every 60 millivolt of band bending, if, Fermi if the valence band edge approaches Fermi level by 60 millivolt, then this whole concentration will increase by how many times? You know, with this exponential relationship, 60 millivolt change in exponent means whole concentration will increase by a factor of 10, right? Let's remember that. So for example, the, the uh, PN junction diode IV increases by a factor of 10 for every 60 millivolt. Same thing, that everything that, anything that follows the QE over KT relationship will increase by 10 times for 60 millivolt change, all right? So before we have a large phi s, before we have say 120, 180 millivolt of phi s, we will have so much charge in the QS through this term, accumulation, that there will be a large V oxide. You see what I'm saying? Right? Since the difference between VG and VFB is split between Q ox, V ox, and phi s, certainly, usually, there is a very small V s, but very small phi s, but very large V ox in the case of accumulation. Right? Okay. So much so that it's often assumed in a textbook that phi s can even be assumed to be zero when we are in accumulation. It's an assumption, of course, um, and uh, if sometimes uh, we don't you know, want to take such a, a, a gross assumption, but right now we're just reviewing the fundamental model of, of uh, uh, MOS uh, capacitor. So let's review this assumption, right? In accumulation, we often say phi s can be considered to be um, to be uh, negligible, all right? And uh, if that's the case, then uh, you will be able to find out uh, uh, Vox very easily. Why? Because Vg equal to Vfb plus Vox plus phi s. If you assume phi s to be zero, then what is Vox? Vox is simply Vg minus Vfb, is that right? VFB is usually assumed known. Once we're given the material for the gate and substrate, we know VFB, and VG assumed given, then we know Vox, correct? So we know Vox. If we know Vox, then we would know QS, the accumulation charge. Why? Because Vox is always equal to minus QS over Cox, correct? And therefore, if I ask you, what is the density of the accumulation charge? Right, the unit will be coulomb per centimeter square accumulation charge. Then you would tell me it's minus C ox V ox, right? If you forget to say minus, that's understandable. But if you're doing a homework and uh, you forgot to put in this minus in your numerical calculation, then that would be uh, not forgivable, right? Because you should know that there's always a negative relationship between V ox and Q s. Is that right? Okay. So QS is equal to minus Cox times Vox, and therefore equal to minus Cox Vg minus Vfb. Okay? All right? All right. Do the sign uh, match up? What do you expect, expect the uh, sign to be in the example we're dealing with? The example we're dealing with will have a layer of holes as the accumulation charge, right? So you expect the QS to be positive. Is that right? Now here, does it make sense? We have a negative sign here. Is this VG larger than, is this VG larger than zero or, or smaller than zero? Can you tell based on this diagram? Is this VG positive or negative? negative. Right, this is because the Fermi level is located uh, above the Fermi level of the reference, the substrate, is that right? Therefore we know VG is negative or and also we, we said VG minus v, VB is a, ah, I shouldn't say that. All right, not only the VG in this example is negative, it's VG minus VFB is also negative because when VG is equal to VFB, the band looks like this, right? 
And in order to make it look like that, we have to apply a more negative voltage than VFB to push this up. So we know this is negative, negative, so everything works out right. All right. What if um, VG is larger than VFB? That means we're going to pull the gate down from the flat band condition, and we end up with this, right? Pull the gate downward from the flat band condition, right? Okay. So uh, we're going to have a positive or negative phi s. When the band bends downward, phi s is positive or negative? It's positive, right? Anytime the band bends downward, is is positive. Remember, I drew the arrow for phi s this way, yeah? Just to remind you, when this band bends downward, phi s is positive, okay? All right. And, uh, and it's hard to define the sign of V aux, but it's probably a good uh, uh, um, um, uh, practice to say that if the um, um, uh, voltage um, on the gate side is lower than the voltage um, on the substrate side, this is called a positive V aux, right? It's probably a good practice to do that, although there's no uh, standard uh, what is the sign of a Vox? But it's probably good practice. This is the positive Vox, right? You can see that's a positive value for Vox. Yeah? Okay. So uh, Vg is equal to, okay. So in this case, then um, um, how can we determine phi s and Vox? Well, it's not as good a, um, a, a, a approximation to ignore phi s, so usually we don't ignore phi s. This is because under this condition, the surface does not have a large density of charge, not, not, not the large thin layer of charge at least. Instead, what we notice is that in this region near the surface, we have depletion region. In fact, we even give this a, um, um, we call this depletion region. We even give a name to this quantity called the depletion region um, with X depletion, right? depletion region width. So uh, um, so uh, usually we don't assume that phi s is zero um, or negligible relative to V aux. Now if neither terms are is negligible, how can we solve this equation for either V aux or phi s? Well, you can do that just by um, expressing V aux in terms of phi s. Let's see how we can do that. Oxide voltage is equal to minus QS over C ox. And in this particular case, we have only one component in the substrate charge, and that's depletion layer charge, all right? We don't have the inversion layer. We don't have accumulation layer. We have depletion layer charge. And we also know what depletion layer charge is. It's equal to Q times the doping concentration of the substrate times depletion layer thickness. Does that make sense? That's the depletion layer charge. Q times Na times X depletion, right? We had a negative sign earlier. We don't have it now at, at this step. Why is that? Well, that's because the charge we have in the depletion region comes from acceptors that have been ionized, right? When the acceptor is ionized, what type of charge does it hold? Acceptor accepts the electron, remember? So when acceptor is ionized, what type of charge does it hold? Positive or negative? When acceptor is ionized, yeah, it holds an electron, therefore holds a negative charge, is that right? Okay. When acceptor is ionized, that means it has taken a, on an electron, so it's negative charge. So we know this is a negative quantity, sh should be negative, therefore we say it's plus QNAX depletion, right? Finally, we have to remember what uh, X depletion expression is in terms of epsilon and phi S. If we do that, we en end up finding out the entire numerator is in the, in the, um, in the um, uh, uh, square root sign, right? In fact, I actually don't remember the equation for X depletion. I don't remember that. I know that there are some things on in the numerator, some things in the denominator. I find it easier to remember the equation for the charge in the depletion region. Because for that 
quantity, we don't have a fraction in the, fr in the uh, square root sign. Everything is in, in, uh, in the numerator. Once I know that, I can calculate the X depletion by dividing the Q depletion by what? By Q and NA, is that right? That's relationship, okay? So I know that the charge in the depletion layer does not contain a fraction. It's two Q, NA, epsilon S, and phi S. So now we have expressed the Vox, the voltage drop in the oxide, in terms of phi S, right? Phi S is the only unknown here. We already know the doping concentration. We assume we know the oxide uh, um, capacitance. So now we substitute this Vox with this expression in terms of uh, phi S, and then we can solve phi S as function of Vg. Is that right? Yeah? And we can also solve Vox as function of Vg, of course, and we look, can uh, get everything we want after solving that equation. Any question about this? Okay. So this is how we uh, model the depletion region. Okay. All right. Finally, we model the uh, threshold uh, um, condition. The threshold, of course, meaning I guess the, the threshold of a door and the um, threshold of a building. By crossing the threshold, you are entering into another realm. So this is the threshold of inversion. If we move beyond this, we are into inversion. And you very well know. That particular point threshold is called VT, that voltage. When VG is VT, we have the threshold of inversion. And uh, the definition of inversion also is, a, um, uh, is a certainly a good question for discussion. Uh, but the one that I think we all uh, learned from our first course in MOS theory is that we define the threshold as the voltage which will bring the electron concentration at a surface, Ns, to make that equal to the, the uh, equilibrium hole concentration and therefore equal to the doping concentration. That's a definition. And there are a few other um, uh, sort of um, uh, definitions that are equivalent to this. Now, move on to this diagram a little bit. Here we're showing, excuse me, the energy band diagram indicating that the um, conduction band has been brought closer to the Fermi level near the sur at the surface than at equilibrium, than the uh, at flat band, which means the electron concentration at the surface is larger than the equilibrium electron concentration. In fact, as we increase Vg, you expect this uh, uh, Ec to be brought closer and closer to Ef. In other words, the quantity that we call the C to become smaller and smaller. Is that right? Yes? At some point, this quantity C will become this quantity D. Is that right? In other words, Fermi level at the, sur at the, at the surface is as close, I'm sorry, the Fermi level is as close to EC at the surface, this quantity C, as it is close to EV in the bulk. That's the condition for electron concentration to be equal to or roughly equal to the doping concentration in the bulk. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So another way of writing that is the EC minus EF at the surface is equal to EF minus EV at the bulk. In other words, <coughs> C equal to D, right? It's easier to think of a C and D rather than EC and EF, right? So when C equal to D, that's another condition for another way to describe a threshold condition. Is it okay? All right? So C equal to D is the condition of a threshold. All right? Good. And uh, finally, we want to answer the question, what is phi S equal to at this threshold condition, at Vt, at threshold? What is phi S equal to? Well, phi S, we say, is equal to 2 phi B, while phi B is defined as A or B in this quantity, particularly defined as B. Phi B is defined as this quantity B, all right? Or Q phi B is defined as quantity B, okay? And therefore, I suppose, well, I'll do it 
this way. Okay, Q5B is equal to B. So what is B then? B is uh, sometimes called the, um, um, the uh, well, I, I don't think there's a very good name for it, so uh, let's not introduce a name. We don't need to know the name. B is the difference between the intrinsic um, um, uh, energy level and the Fermi level, right? This B would be very large if the doping concentration is large. B would be zero if the substrate is undoped, uh, truly uh, intrinsic, yeah? Now typically, what is B equal to? Well, it's somewhat less than half a band gap, right? Half a band gap will be 0 0.6 volts, 0 0.55, 0 0.6 volts. Therefore, B typically will maybe 0.4 volts, right? That will be B, okay? Now, there's another way to describe the threshold. If C is equal to D, if C is equal to D, would you agree that B is equal to A? The reason is that A plus C is half the band, band gap, and D plus B is half the band gap. You see that? So A is equal to B is another condition or definition of the, uh, of the uh, uh, threshold. Now, why do I introduce this? Because you should be able to tell that the band bending, the phi S, the band bending is equal to B plus A. Just follow this dotted line, to follow this uh, mid-gap uh, energy level. Do you see that band bending the bending of this mid-gap mid level is equal to B plus A, you see? When the band bends B, it's this point. Up to this point, the bending is B. From this point to this point is an additional bending of A, right? Since we already concluded A is equal to B, therefore, phi and B is equal to phi Q phi B, therefore, phi S is equal to two times of phi B, is that right? Phi S is equal to C plus A. I'm sorry. Phi S is equal to A plus B, therefore equal to 2B, therefore equal to 2 times Phi B. Is that right? Okay. Typically about 0.8 volt. So all these three definitions are equivalent. And uh, it should be, it's good to, uh, to um, uh, be familiar with all three because uh, one or the other may be more convenient <coughs> at a given point for a big of a problem, all right? So right now, the most important thing to use is this, okay? We're gonna use that one. And specifically, phi B <coughs> is defined as one over Q of EI minus EF, <coughs> and using a uh, simple uh, relationship between the EI and the dope and EF and the doping concentration, we can show that phi B is just equal to this quantity, all right? I know many of you have um, memorized this, if not, it's probably worthwhile to remember this relationship. Phi B is KT over Q mm -hmm. log of NA over NI, right? That's Phi B, typically half a volt or so, okay? <coughs> and you might want to keep in mind that this is just one possible definition of VT. We can talk about later why this is a reasonable definition of VT. Another definition of VT and when you think about it, maybe many of you would uh, say it actually makes more sense, and maybe we should uh, use that as uh, the, the, the starting point to teach students as the threshold, is to say we reach threshold when, we have a s when the electron concentration reaches a certain significant value, regardless what the doping concentration is. If we have significant amount of uh, uh, electron near the surface, that's called a threshold, right? That actually makes a lot of sense, particularly when you think about MOS transistors. What is threshold? It's when you start to have current flow. In order to have current flow, you have to have a significant number of electrons. Doesn't matter whether you dope this substrate heavily or not. When you have these electrons, you're gonna have significant current flow. If you don't have it, you don't have the current flow. Is that right? Right, that makes a lot of sense. If you think about that, then the band bending would be equal to B, this, and then that A may not be equal to B, is that right? Band A, B, A may not be equal to B, right? But A has to be large enough to position this Fermi level close enough to the EC. In other words, we have to make C fairly small. Let's say uh, 0.15 EV. C has to be 0.15 EV. If C is 0.15 EV, what would A have to be? Remember, A plus C, you know what that is. What is A plus C? It's half a band gap, right? 
So if C is equal to 0.15 EV, what would A have to be? What's that? Let's say 0.4, something like that. Here I call that 0.45, right? So you will say, all right, then phi S at threshold should be equal to 1 phi B, not 2 times phi B, but 1 times phi B plus 0 0.45 volt, right? And that actually makes a lot of sense. And uh, some of you may already know, in, in reality, in laboratory, when you measure threshold voltage, there's also controversy how you measure threshold voltage. So it's not uh, uh, um, um, surprising that in the mathematical definition of threshold voltage, it not, should not be such a simple choice. And this certainly offers a very attractive alternative. So you may think about that, whether you like this definition better than the other one or the other way around, and uh, what's the uh, reason to choose one or the other? Right? You may want to think about that. And can you suggest uh, yet another alternative for the definition of threshold? Okay. Just what is threshold? What does threshold mean to you? What do you think that is the importance of having a concept of threshold? And what is that concept? And what kind of uh, uh, definition does that concept uh, suggest? Okay. All right. So now that we know the uh, phi s at threshold, we can write down expression for Vt. After all, what is Vt? Vt is the gate voltage which will make phi s equal to 2 phi b. Is that right? Because we already said the definition of threshold is that when phi s equal to 2 phi b. So the question is what Vg is needed to bring phi s to 2 phi b? That Vg is called threshold voltage. Is that right? Now what is that voltage then? What is that gate voltage that will bring phi s equal to 2 phi b? We always start with this relationship. Any Vg is equal to Vfb plus phi s plus Vox. All right? Okay? At threshold, what is phi s equal to? Phi s equal to 2 phi b. Didn't we say that? All right? So we say Vt equal to Vfb plus 2 phi b. All right? That's the phi s. Yeah? This phi s term will be replaced by 2 phi b. Right? Unless you like this definition better, of course, then you should put that term for for the uh, in place of two phi b, right? Okay, whatever you think is the right surface potential as threshold. Plus the Vox at that point. What is Vox equal to? Do you remember what Vox is equal to? Vox is always equal to minus Qs divided by Cox, right? So here we have the Cox here. So clearly, this is our QS. What is QS? QS is the charge in the depletion layer. Now, do you remember the charge in the depletion layer? Is there a fraction in it? No, there isn't. It's the square root of 2 Q epsilon S Na times band bending in the depletion region, right? And what is band bending? It's 2 phi B. Is that right? Is that right? Now, if someday you see this 2 phi b is not there, but something that looks like that is there. Would you be surprised? I should not be surprised. The question is we don't know what phi s is at threshold. Is that right? Yes? Yeah? OK. So this should be a very simple equation to remember. In fact, you should not remember this uh, by rote. I think uh, you should really just remember this equation. Vt equal to Vfb plus phi s plus Vox. And be able to write down what is phi s at threshold, what is Vox at threshold. All right? OK. Now the last slide, I think, is inversion. What if we go beyond the, 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 uh, the threshold when Vg is even larger than Vt? Well, when Vg is larger than Vt, we make approximation very similar to the uh, accumulation case. That is, we say the phi s, the surface potential, does not increase beyond anymore. It will stop, saturates at 2 phi b. We say phi s is roughly equal to 2 phi b, all right? Although we know it actually will go beyond, it's larger than 2 phi b. What we typically assume is it's uh, roughly at 2 phi b. It's not much larger than 2 phi b um, in the same um, um, spirit as assumed the band does not bend in the inversion uh, regime. The reason is 
as uh, this uh, fire S go beyond the 2 phi B by 60 millivolt, the electron concentration becomes 10 times larger than the doping concentration. If it goes down by 120 millivolt, then it's 100 times larger than doping concentration. So very quickly, we'll get 10 to the 19 and uh, more of electron density at the surface. And that large elec density of electron will cause very large Vox to appear because of the large QS of which the inversion charge is a part. Okay? And therefore, we often can assume that phi S is pinched or saturates at uh, 2 phi B. In that case, then uh, we can um, uh, simplify this equation by saying Vg equal to Vfb plus 2 phi B. This is approximation. We're assuming it's fixed at 2 phi B. In reality, it's not. Plus minus Q depletion plus Q inversion over C ox. Beyond inversion, beyond uh, threshold into inversion, we know we're going to have inversion in a charge in addition to the depletion charge. All right? Because we're assuming band bending does not increase beyond 5B, we are also assuming Q depletion doesn't increase. We're assuming the band bending does increase. Therefore, we assume the depletion layer thickness does not increase. In fact, you remember this quantity, this notation, xd max, right? Depletion layer thickness max maxes out at this point, and therefore the charge doesn't increase and stays at 2q epsilon s na 2 phi b. And this remaining term is q inversion minus c ox is nu. You see that? Now you notice the first three terms should look very familiar to you. What, what are these first three terms together? That's the VT that we talked about in the <coughs> previous slide. Isn't that right? Is that right? And therefore we can say we can put Q inversion maybe on the other side and we get this equation. Q inversion is equal to minus C ox VG minus VT. That's very useful to remember because Q inversion determines the amount of current that flows through the transistor, and uh, so it's a quantity we're going to use a lot. Um, I like to think that what this last equation is telling us is that we are indeed dealing with a simple capacitor, and therefore we have this Q equal to CV relationship. Um, the only thing that looks funny is that there's offset in the voltage. The V is offset by VG, VT threshold. That makes sense because when VG equal to when VG is equal to VT, we expect zero Q inversion, right? So it makes sense. So it's a, it's a capacitor. Q inversion is equal to C ox VG minus VT, and you should be able to explain why the man, minus signs is there. Okay. Okay. We'll stop here today. Any questions about what we uh, covered? We reviewed the uh, the MOS theory. Okay. All right. If not, then uh, we'll we'll um, um, quit uh, here, and I'll see you on Thursday. This is from Jen, and uh, he mentioned that you point him to some address here, uh -huh. and he go there. He didn't find any like. Uh,